tutorial on the on uh, uh, free field theory in uh, two dimensions or in one plus one dimension. And uh, today is really more the first lecture. So, um, so Bruno in his lecture is talking about hydrodynamics and and, and uh, generalized hydrodynamics. Um, so there will be some large overlap with that, and uh, also Thierry Jean-Marc is going to uh, give an introduction to Lottinger liquids, and I'll be kind of interpolating uh, between both. So uh, today I want to talk about uh, classical hydrodynamics. Classical hydrodynamics uh, of a of a 1D quantum gas. And uh, I will discuss on this only uh, at the what's called the uh, Euler scale. And I will, I will explain what that is. Uh, this is also what Bruno is uh, doing, although he's not using the name Euler scale. Uh, all right, so um, okay, so let's start with uh, a simple model. So, so a uh, first a uh, first look at uh, hydrodynamics. So I'm going to take a, a model, classical model. So I have classical particles on a lattice with lattice spacing A. So the lattice is A times Z. I have classical particles. And the, so which live on the... Statis statistical uh, rules for jumps. And the rules are the following. So at between time t and uh, t plus dt, so in a small t uh, time step, each particle can jump either to the right or to the left if uh, the neighboring site is empty. So this particle cannot move here because the site is already occupied, but this one can move here. And it does this with probability dt over a, if it jumps to the right, and q times dt over a, if it jumps to the left. q is just um, a real parameter that allows to take q different from one in order to break uh, parity. Okay, so this model is called the ASEP for asymmetric simple exclusion process. And it's uh, okay. It's a very important model for out of equilibrium uh, classical statistical physics uh, and I won't uh, discuss I won't enter this model in any details it's just that it's it's a it's a perfect uh, model to illustrate uh, what I want to what I want to say um, so this model conserves particle number and so we can write a continuity a continuity equation for it uh okay so n 
between brackets is the average number of particles at position x. So we have some random, uh, some probability distribution on all possible configurations. And uh, we are looking at the, so the mean value of the number of particles at a point x. And we can write the following equation. where uh, j is the current, and the current in the, in the ASAP can be written as this. Uh, let me just get it right. Uh, minus q. And it's the discrete version of what... Uh, Bruno. I mean, it's continuous in time, but discrete in space, yes. Mm -hmm. um, yes, all right. So this uh, equation, as you, as you know, um, either you already know it or, or you learned it from Bruno. So this just expresses number, uh, part, uh, conservation of the total number of particles. So why is that? Because if you sum this over x, so you take sum of the whole thing over x, then this uh, just cancels. This gives 0, assuming at least that the current is uh, 0 uh, outside, so at, uh, 0 at infinity, say. So this just gives zero, and then you get the uh, then you get that the derivative with respect to time of the of sum over x of n x, which is the total particle number, uh, vanishes. So total particle number is conserved. Now the question is: Is is this useful? So is this continuity equation useful? And if you just have the continuity equation, then the answer is not really. Because if you, if you, if you want to calculate the current, then you still need to know in what state to evaluate this, uh, this uh, expectation value here. And, and that's uh, typically uh, very complicated. So you, if you want to just to write the current explicitly, then actually you still, at this point you still need to solve the full uh, many-body system. Uh, so even, and even though it's classical, this is really hard. So, so at this point, this is kind of uh, useless. But it becomes extremely powerful if uh, you, on top of that, you make another, uh, uh, on top of that, you make an assumption, and this is the assumption of separation of scales. So here, what, you want, what we want to do is to say that, let's assume that this n of x is given by some uh, continuous, smoothly varying function uh, rho of x, and we, we view that now as a, as a continuous function. So we imagine that our uh, lattice spacing a is is qu is quite uh, is is very small compared to the typical variation of of rho of x. Okay. So then there are two scales in the problem. One is the mi microscopic microscopic length scale, which uh, you may take as the Typically, the, the interparticle distance, which is going to be a divided by rho in uh, these notations, and then there's a mac macroscopic macroscopic uh, length scale, which uh, is the typical length on which uh, on which the density varies, and so this we can write as we can estimate to be of order rho divided by dx rho. Absolute value. And what we want is that d is much smaller than L, but not only that d is much smaller th than L, that actually that there's an, inter an intermediate scale 
mesoscopic scale uh, between them, so much larger than the uh, interparticle distance, but much smaller than the scale on which the density varies. So the, the picture is the following. Let me draw it here. So we have, here we have the density that is smoothly varying over some scale uh, L. But if we cu cut a small piece here, then on that, at that scale here, which is going to be the, this mesoscopic scale, so at that, at that scale, at that scale the system is, you c we can view it as both thermodynamically lar large, so thermodynamically large because it contains a huge number of particles, thermodynamically large, and uh, homogeneous. homogeneous. And then if we zoom in uh, further, then at some point we will see the microscopic structure. So at this point we really see the particles. And uh, here we have this microscopic scale. Uh, yes, the length scales are x dependent, but uh, if yeah, okay. So there's a mesoscopic scale here, which depends on x, the, this scale here depends on x. Yes. Mm -hmm. And I don't need to assume it's uniform or anything. But uh, I mean, if you feel more comfortable, uh, you can just assume that there's a let's say there's a let's say it's uni. That, yeah, let. let <laughs> You can take it to be homogeneous if you want, but uh, it's not necessary. Uh, yeah, you just need this locally. Mm -hmm. Are you something At the moment, uh, not, but uh, you can if you want. I mean, this is a uh, you know, it's it's not it's a rather heuristic. Uh, d uh, discussion. I, I'm not claiming that this can be made uh, rigorous. I just want to give, uh, to discuss the basic assumptions that are underlying uh, hydrodynamics uh, at a heuristic level. Okay, so we are assuming that we have a separation of length scales such that, so that we have this intermediate scale at which uh, the system can be bo can be viewed as both thermodynamically large and homogeneous. So that's really a key point. Uh, and on top of that, we are also assuming, so this is separation of length scales, we are also assuming uh, separation of time scales. Uh, so, uh, so we have a, yeah, so we, Okay, so just by, by analogy with that, what we want is that we want to imagine that there's a, a microscopic uh, relaxation time, so that very quickly at the microscope, uh, very quickly uh, a, a small piece of uh, one of these mesoscopic uh, pieces of, of fluid, which I'm going sometimes to call uh, mesoscopic uh, fluid cell. So we, are, we assume that there's a relaxation time uh, such that the mesoscopic fluid st cell quickly goes to, a, uh, quickly goes to a, a stationary state and uh, that, there, that this is much smaller than the typical time on which the density varies, which is also which is, uh, of this order by analogy with this. And so again, we want that there is a mesoscopic uh, time scale on which uh, the system is uh, can be viewed as look as stationary in time. Um, yes, and if this is true, then uh, then we can describe the state in time inside a mesoscopic fluid cell on these time scales as a, uh, not only a homogeneous uh, system, but also, uh, also stationary. Uh, 
Okay. And now if we do that, so as under these assumptions, uh, we can write an equation of state. So we can write a relation between the current J and the density rho. So why is that? Because um, if we now work, so okay, so we need to evaluate J. But under these assumptions, we can replace the uh, the state, the, so the exact state of the system at position x and time t, by uh, by a, a stationary state of the of the homogeneous problem in the thermodynamic limit. And it turns out that for the ASEP, these uh, stationary states are particularly simple. So, in, and in fact, we, you don't even need to work in the thermodynamic limit. So for the ASEP, if you work with a periodic uh, ASEP of size M, so M sites, particles hopping on M sites uh, with the rules I described uh, b earlier. It turns out the stationary states are of this form. So the stationary states uh, simply factorize. So this is, uh, uh, so this means that basically you just get a product, the, the distribution of particles is just a product. So you can write this as as this. So this is the stationary state. So just a product. So on every site, you can have either have a particle or no particle. You have a particle with probability rho, and no particle with probability one minus rho, and rho is the uh, is the density. So because the, f the stationary state uh, is so simple, it's uh, trivial to evaluate the expectation value of the current. And Okay, and so what you find is just that the current in evaluated in one of those uh, nice mesoscopic uh, uh, cells in a stationary state. I'm going to call that sometimes the local macro state or uh, local stationary state. Okay, but this is, I think Bruno is calling it, how, Bruno, where is Bruno? How do you call it? Okay, I'm going to drop the quasi because uh, I don't I don't like to call things quasi something, but uh, all right. Uh, local stationary state. Good. Uh, and uh, yes, yeah, so you just evaluate this and you find that this is 1 minus Q times rho. Okay, so drop the X because now rho times 1 minus rho. So it's not so important what exactly this function is. The point is that J is a function of rho. So J is a function of the density. That's what matters. And now, now the continuity equation becomes extremely powerful because now you can write that this, so this is the equation of state. And this coupled with the continuity equation uh, 
Uh, now this provides a complete description because you can just plug the formula for the current in here and you end up with a simple uh, partial differential equation for the, that describes the evolution of rho. So this is a huge simplification compared to the full microscopic problem. And, uh, and it works under these assumptions, this assumption. Sorry? That's a Burgers equation, yes, still, but uh, that's fine. You don't agree that it's simple. Yeah, I'm not saying that it's entirely solved. I'm just saying that if you imagine that you have to, if you imagine that you want to treat this numerically, for instance, then, uh, I mean, here it's just uh, solving this differential equation, and it's still much simpler than solving the full microscopic problem, especially when we are going to go to the quantum case, because then, I mean, here you can still find efficient methods just to simulate the full microscopic problem. It's a classical problem. You can do whatever, uh, Monte Carlo, or things like that. But, uh, but in the quantum case, you can't do anything. So. Uh, all right. So let me just comment. Sorry? Uh -huh. Yes? Mm-hmm. Ah, it's just that there's a, it's periodic, but there's, there's a current because the pr particles prefer to hop on one side uh, rather than the other. I need to, I need an asymmetry because otherwise the current would just be zero. At ah, no, but it's okay. So this is just a drawing. It, by periodic, I mean this, and, and when this one hops here, it, it, it goes back here. So that's, that's left and right. Um, yes. Let me just comment on the vocabulary, uh, this Euler scale that I men mentioned. So Euler scale means, uh, in, in this lecture, it's going to mean that the current is only a function of the density and not on the derivatives. So more generally, the current could be a function also, say, on the, of the first derivative and higher order derivatives. More in, in general, the right way to think of this is that uh, the current should have some, uh, should appear in a gradient expansion in the in, as a, in the functional of in this functional of rho uh, and uh, but if you do this with a derivative term here then you uh, end up with dissipative terms in your hydrodynamic equations uh, and those terms uh, and, and and so this is beyond uh, the euler scale so euler scale refers to the fact that the currents are functions only of the density at a, at the, of the values of the density at a point, and not the, not the derivatives. So, for instance, uh, uh, Bruno was discussing Fourier's law. Uh, so, Fourier's law is if uh, if, if when you insert uh, this term here, and actually, okay. So, if I was putting q equals one, then the current at the Euler scale would vanish. And then I would have an, another term that would be include the that would be, be uh, the gradient of, of x, derivative of x with respect, derivative of rho with respect to x with some coefficient, and that, uh, that, would, lead to, uh, that would lead to diffusion. But we are not uh, going to consider that. It's beyond the order of scale in the sense that these are derivatives, and so as soon as, as long as all the density is very smooth, very sufficiently small, uh, slowly, all these terms are uh, very small, and so we are going to neglect them. Yes. Well, because uh, if okay, so in this model, for instance, if you take q equals one, so that it doesn't break parity, then uh, the current at this scale vanishes. You see. 
So here I had to break, this is the reason why I looked at the ASEP, so asymmetric, asymmetric uh, model, because, uh, because I need to break parity, otherwise for this model it's just trivial. Yes? Yes, yes, yes. Mm -hmm. Yes, I'm just repeating what you said. I just uh, want to uh, I just want to make it clear what I mean by this vocabulary uh, Euler scale. Okay, so because if you write Euler equations, then it's the equations without dissipation, and that comes uh, because the currents are functions only of the densities. All right, uh, good. So. What can I erase? Uh, this. Uh, yes, okay, so I want to go slowly go towards the quantum case, but um, uh, before I do that, uh, let me discuss uh, Galilean Galilean invariance. So the 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 ASAP is a nice uh, model because it has a sim it has only one uh, conserved quantity, which is the total number of particles. And this is why it leads to such a simple uh, hydrodynamic description because, uh, and also because the stationary states are very simple. So this is why it's so simple in the end, it's just because there's a single uh, conserved quantity and, uh, and you can evaluate the current uh, in a very simple way. Uh, so this is not true in general, more generally. Uh, and I'm going to focus uh, on models that have uh, conserved conserved mass, uh, momentum, and energy, and in fact uh, also more conservation laws, but for today I'm just going to forget that there are more conser conserved quantities. Uh, yes. Okay, so what does it mean to be a Galilean invariant? It means that the system should uh, transform in a, in a simple way under Galilean boosts. And a Galilean boost is just if I take the velocity of uh, one particle in all the velocities of all particles in the system and I change them to V plus W, uh, then the, the laws of, of physics shouldn't change. So, in a system with conserved mass, momentum, and energy, we want to keep track of the mass density, the momentum density, and the energy density at position x and uh, time t. And so the question is, how does this uh, thing behave under a Galilean boost? And uh, so it's, it's relatively simple. So first of all, the quantities, uh, since they are boosted, you should look at them as if they were depending now on x minus wt. Uh, this simply expresses the fact that if you boost, it, you take your particles, you boost them, then uh, you're looking at them as at a, at a, at a position which is, happens to be this one. And, okay, so, and uh, this is not, uh, this is not, uh, it's quite. Uh, this is not uh, the end of the story. So, so the mass density you just get by looking at the mass density uh, translated by this by by W times T. But the momentum density 
uh, changes because you're, ki you're giving some uh, additional velocity to the particles, so it changes their momentum. And so the new momentum density after you have applied the boost is given by the old momentum density plus uh, W times the mass density. So that you get uh, a W here, and you can do the same for the energy density, and you'll see that at, in the end it looks like that. So this is how uh, the three densities transform under a Galilean boost. So if you want to, I mean, if you want to something concrete just to see, see how these laws work, uh, you can take just a classical system of particles where the, where, where the density of particles at, at position, so the mass density would just be sum over x minus xj for particles at position xj. The momentum density would simply be mass times vj. And the energy density would be, uh, let's say, mass so one half vj squared, delta x minus xj at position x. And uh, yes, yeah, so this would just be free particles. You could also do that with a with a with a with a potential energy. Um, uh, so, uh, yeah, with uh, some interaction energy that uh, that is Galilean invariant. So okay, so you just do the boost, and you see that it, it transforms that way. All right. Now uh, you plug this into the continuity equation, and uh, you'll find uh, conservation. Uh, you'll find us a certain transformation law for the currents. So you plug this. into uh, the continuity equation. And uh, this gives you some transformation for the current under. So I'm not uh, going to write it because it's not so interesting. So this same, it looks a bit like that. Uh, I wrote some notes. You can find it in the notes. And uh, the point is that um, because of this uh, particular transformation laws, uh, you can actually show in the end, if you also assume that the system is uh, parity invariant, so, so Galilean invariance plus parity invariance. So parity just it means it's invariant under, uh, if I just do a reflection. Uh, then, so the, consequ the consequence is that, you see, I have these three, uh, I have these three conserved quantities. So I should have three, I should have three continuity equations. So a momentum, uh, momentum current and uh, an energy current. And uh, so assuming separation of scales and so on, I want to be able to write J as a function of, so I want to write, the th I want to be able to write the three currents, J, J, P, and J, E, as some function of the three, of the, of the three densities, rho, rho, P, and rho, E. Yes, yes, thanks. Mm -hmm. Thank you. So if I have that, then I have my equation of state, and uh, I'm in business, I can do uh, hydrodynamics. Um, so my point is because of Galilean invariance, because these tr things transform in a special way, and if you assume also a parity invariance, uh, then you can actually see that this function cannot be completely arbitrary 
because in fact the current of particles, so the, the mass current, has to be equal to the momentum density. Uh, this is perhaps the most famous uh, uh, consequence of Galilean invariance in this context. Uh, but there are also two other things. So the, the momentum current has to be, uh, cannot be just of any uh, form. It has to be related, it has to be given by the pressure. Uh, let me just, what is this? E minus rho P squared over two rho. And the energy current uh, has also to, uh, is also given by, as a function of the pressure. So this is a consequence of Galilean invariance. I just, so, okay, because you add this symmetry, uh, the relation between the densities and the currents cannot be completely arbitrary. And in fact, in the end, it uh, involves a si only one f uh, function that needs to be determined, and that's the pressure. It's the pressure as a function of the density and, uh, and uh, the uh, energy density. So this is the Okay, rho E is the total energy, and if you imagine that you boost, you, you have state, a state with a finite uh, current, and if you boost it back uh, so that the current vanishes, the, then the uh, energy density in this boosted state is this one. So this is, like the, pr this is the pressure in states uh, without current. Uh, what, what do you mean? So I just, I said this is the, I, I just, okay, I, ju I said this is the equation of state. I mean, in a, in a I, but at this point it's, uh, I don't know what this function f is. And then I just mean as a function of Galilean invariance, I end up with, I can actually uh, constrain uh, these, constrain this uh, thing here and in the end what pops out is that uh, is that I have these relations with only one function that uh, is not that I need to determine only one unknown function but I see here from this equation that the function if I take a state with no current so where rho p is zero then this function is just the momentum current and in, a, and in a system with a Galilean invariance, the momentum current is the pressure. So this has to be the equilibrium pressure. Well, it's really the pressure. So you have to convince yourself that uh, the momentum current is the pressure. Uh, maybe you can do that as an exercise. Uh, yeah. I mean, at this point, if you want, you can just consider that it's a function that happens to be called P. Uh, but it's, in the end, it's really the physical pressure. Sorry? Yes, yes. Mm -hmm. All right, so, I mean, this won't be so important, but what's, what's important is just uh, to connect this to uh, perhaps uh, more standard, uh, more standard uh, discussions of uh, of, uh, of, uh, of hydrodynamics and, and equations for fluid dynamics more generally. So in this form, so again, so everything as, uh, everything relies on the assumption of separation of scales and. Um, and now in on, if on top of that we add Galilean invariance and parity invariance, we end up with this form for the currents. And then you can easily rewrite the continuity equation where you inject the equation of state in that form as this.
where uh, u is rho p divided by rho, which has the interpretation of being the mean, so the, the local uh, velocity of the fluid, local velocity of the fluid, and e, e is rho e minus rho p squared over 2 rho divided by rho, and this is the internal energy per unit mass. Okay? So these are the Euler equations as you can uh, as you in this in standard form. Uh, this, I mean, this you can find on, on Wikipedia. So if you look for hydrodynamics on Wikipedia, this is what you will find. Um, but uh, I. There's uh, uh, no, there's uh, I have it wrong in my notes. Sorry. Uh, okay, it's probably a knee. Can someone check on Wikipedia? <laughs> I, th I think it's I think it's a knee, but uh, I I I, uh, I have a typo in the notes. So just to be sure, uh, if you look for Google Euler equations, you'll find this. Um, all right, so this is just to emphasize the connection between uh, what uh, Bruno is discussing and what I'm discussing with standard uh, hydrodynamics. Now, uh, there are two things that I would like to say uh, before the break. Uh, so the first thing is that, um, okay, I'm going to apply this to a quantum gas. We will, uh, this, uh, this is what I, w I, s I call doing classical hydrodynamics. It's what? I'd say it's you, okay. Uh, so actually it was correct in my notes, okay. All right. Thanks. Uh, yeah, so I'm going to apply this to a, a quantum gas. Uh, and uh, there, there will be, there are just two things that I would like to emphasize. So the first is that we are going to do this at zero temperature. And uh, it turns out that this third equation, which, is, which really expresses uh, con uh, conservation of energy, conservation of energy, uh, by using some thermodynamic, um, by using some thermodynamic identity, you can, uh, which I, is in the notes, uh, you can rewrite it as, con as uh, the fact that the the entropy uh, moves with the moves with the flow. If you want, this now is the the entropy entropy per particle or per unit uh, mass. So y the third equation, third Euler equation, uh, you can rewrite as this. And since we are going to work with fluids that have zero temperature, zero entropy, in fact, this will be always trivial, trivially satisfied, and so we will drop it. So the third equation, al although it is there, it, I mean, con conservation of energy is there, it will, it will just drop because it will be satisfied automatically. Okay? And this is also the justification for doing this for systems with infinitely many conservation laws. It's because actually all the other ones, they are satisfied automatically at, if, you state, if you focus on zero entropy states. Just, okay, so if you, ha if you didn't understand what I just said, uh, uh, don't worry, it's just for the experts. Uh, so I know that what the system I'm going to look at has infinitely many conservation laws, but turns out I need only two, 
and all the other ones are satisfied automatically. Uh, and the last thing I want to say is just that we are also going to focus on gases in potentials, and so we need to have a we need to have a force term. And uh, and so what what does the, an external potential do? Well, so it won't it will not break conservation of mass. So mass will still be conserved even if we have if we switch, switch on a potential. However, momentum will not be conserved if we switch, switch on a potential. So, and why isn't, why isn't uh, momentum conserved in the presence of a, pot uh, in the presence of a, of a potential or a, of a force? Well, uh, you know, this is just uh, Newton's uh, second law. And so, if you think about what Newton's second law is for a, high, for the, for a fluid, uh, then this is just uh, what, what the equation should, uh, looks like. So the, it's this form of the equations that we are going to use. So again, I'm going to drop the third one. I'm going to drop the th third one, and I'm going to focus only on those two. So this is the continuity equation for the mass, and this is the Euler equation. Uh, should I stop here? Uh, Well, okay, so let me just continue for two minutes. Um, so now I'm going to turn to the model that I'm really interested in. Now that we have discussed the, the basic principles of, uh, hydrodyna of a hydrodynamic description. And uh, so the model we are going to be interested in is this. So it's a quantum model now with a Hamiltonian. Okay, so Psi is uh, an operator. Psi and Psi dagger are uh, annihilation, annihilation creation operators. Uh, that create and annihilate bosons in on a one-dimensional line. So they satisfy the canonical anti-commutation relations. And uh, solving this problem for, for a reasonably large number of particles is just impossible, even numerically. I mean, the state of the art numerically is to do something like uh, 40 or 50 particles. And and if you look at exper I mean, if you want to model an experiment, I mean, depending on the experiments, you may need a few thousands of particles. So this is uh, this is not good. But you can apply a hydrodynamic uh, description. So this model has conserved uh, conserved number of particles. So there's a particle uh, density operator or mass density operator, which is just this. It has a momentum current operator, which is just this. And it has an, iner an energy, densi energy density uh, operator, which is just the Hamiltonian uh, density. So it's, uh, OK, so it's. Okay, let me let me drop the. Okay, for for the moment, let me put v equals zero, uh, and then this is just uh, this. Okay. 
So this, these are three uh, conserved quantities. So if you integrate over x, it gives a, a globally conserved quantity. Uh, there are other conserved quantities, but uh, we will, again, uh, we will forget them, at least for today. And uh, as Bruno explained in his lectures, uh, you can write a, a you can write a continuity equation at the Euler level. Uh, uh, sorry, at the at the operator level. So which uh, okay, so which uh, you may write as this, for instance. But this, I mean, this is just a okay. So I want to integrate the density on a small segment such that the, se the ends of the, the endpoints of the, of the segment x and x prime are well separated, and then uh, this should be correspond to the difference of two uh, currents like that. Uh, so Bruno had a similar definition, I think. And then, uh, okay, so consequently, dt rho plus dxj. Is zero. This is a. This is the continuity equation at the, at the operator level. And now, of course, if it's true for the operators, it's also true for the expectation, but for their expectation values. And so, uh, so if you work not with the operators directly, but with their expectation values, so you call this rho x and t. This is operator x times t. So you replay you trade this for that. Uh, well, then then you're in business again. Uh, you are again doing hydrodynamics because you can. Uh, we, okay, so make again relying on the assumption of separation of scales. Uh, and so local stationarity, the quantum state uh, in a local fluid cell can be replaced by some stationary state of the translation invariant model so that you can uh, evaluate the current in principle, so the expectation value of this operator, and, and, and plug them into the continuity equation. And this gives you a description, a description in terms of only uh, classical variables the classical variables being just the expectation values of the the three uh, densities here and so th then everything i've said applies because it's a galilean invariant system which is parity invariant so everything goes through and so what we need to do, le learn now is how to calculate the pressure uh, at zero temperature, so in the ground state. Uh, and this is what I will discuss after the break. Yes? So turning off the potential means uh, you look at a, at a homogeneous, at the homogeneous case, and this happens if you this is what happens under this assumption of separation of scales. If, so if I look at the, at the intermediate scales, so, uh, then the system looks locally homogeneous. So I can calculate things at V equals zero in, in, at that scale. Yeah, okay, so there, uh, well, this is what I'm going to discuss. Uh, after the break, so maybe, yeah, we'll see after the break. Non-hermitian? No, no, they're, I mean, they're observable, so. Sorry? Those? No, no, they are hermitian. Why? Yes, I mean, they're observables, right? So, so yeah, they have to be. Why, why, why are you confused? Ah, sorry, sorry, sorry. Yes, of course, yes, yes. Thank you, yeah. Yeah, <coughs> sorry. Thank you.
Okay. Other questions? No? Okay. Is it okay? Um, okay. So, all right. So this, uh, so this this quantum gas here, we are going to describe in terms of these classical hydrodynamic equations. Uh, but to do this, we need uh, we need to we need a, a method to calculate the pressure uh, as a function. So the pressure in uh, in states uh, in the ground state essentially, because we are going to focus at uh, uh, to focus on uh, on zero temperature. So okay, so we work at zero temperature, and we want to know the pressure p as a function of the uh, the, den the density rho so the uh, as i said earlier so the pressure would also depend in principle of the energy density but since we are going to focus at zero temperature then locally the system will be in its ground state or up to a uh, up to a galilean boost and so uh, the energy density itself in the ground state is itself a, den a function of the of the density so the thing th so the only thing that you need to know to know the local state of the system is the is the local density and the uh, and the local velocity of the fluid or local momentum so the dependence on on energy is has dropped because we are focusing on this okay so we need to calculate this and and this will be given by um so this will be given by the equation of love um so it's 3 2 so the equation of love. So who knows the equation of love? A lucky you. So uh, um, yeah. So okay. So in principle, I would have to enter uh, the beta on that at, the, at this point. Uh, but. But I want to avoid the beta ansatz uh, for this first lecture, and on the other hand, I still want to give you uh, just the flavor, the general flavor uh, of what kind of uh, equations you have to work with uh, if you actually want to calculate this pressure. And uh, so let me just give you give you the results. So this equation of love uh, it reads like this. Uh, so this is the equation of love. So G here is the G that is the in, is the interaction strength, which we take to be positive always in these lectures. Um, so the interaction is repulsive between the at between the atoms. Uh, so theta is theta is uh, is what's called the rapidity, uh, which you can roughly think of as being a velocity of uh, excitations of the system. Uh, so again, I don't want to enter any details of the beta ansatz today. And rho p, rho p. Of theta is the so-called uh, density 
density of rapidities, or you may think of it as the density of uh, excitations or of quasi-particles. Uh, so here I can really not avoid the quasi, unfortunately. But so uh, here, density of quasi-particles um, that are moving with uh, uh, rapidity theta uh, at posi around the position, uh, yeah. So this uh, is homogeneous to an inverse, uh, so this is an inverse in inverse length times uh, an inverse uh, velocity. And theta f, theta f, so f stands for Fermi, so this is the Fermi, uh, let's call it Fermi rapidity. So, uh, okay, so I won't explain where this comes from. Uh, at least not today. Uh, but the point is that what once you have this function rho p of theta, then the mass density, so this is the, again the mass density, so the mass density is is simple. Because it's just going to it's just given by the integral of this rho p and the energy density is also simple. In the, so this is in the ground state, in the ground state of that model with v equals zero. So this is describing the properties of the ground state of H at v equals zero in the thermodynamic limit. Uh, row E. Uh, well, it's just uh, this. So, okay, and then, f uh, so this gives us the mass density and the energy density in the ground state. And then, uh, using some thermodynamic uh, relation, uh, which you can write as this. So uh, this is the internal uh, energy per unit mass. So this is temperature divided by M times uh, dS. S is the entropy minus P uh, d1 over rho. Okay, so this is some thermodynamic uh, relation. Uh, Um, so, well, again, I don't want to enter any details of the beta ansatz here, so I would rather avoid that discussion. But, um, okay, so if you want to, a way to think of it, you can roughly think of those as, as follows. You have your system. Uh, you may want to describe your system in terms of uh, how the uh, of the velocities of the atoms or momenta of the atoms, but the system is interacting, so those are not well-defined quantities. Instead, you have excitation, elementary excitations of the system, which uh, you may call quasi-particles, and those quasi-particles have some well-defined uh, momenta, or, and uh, basically the theta you can think of as the velocity of these quasi-particles. But uh, yeah, this is. Uh, well, because it's complicated, you know, and uh, and without talking about beta ansatz, I mean, I can't really, I can't really be precise. So, 
But uh, Bruno, I'm sure, will talk about this in much more details. And I will also try to do talk about this in more details, uh, probably on the last lecture. Yes. I don't understand the word of what you said. Uh. So, so basically here, I don't see why it's extensive. You need to do it out. Uh, right. you know, I don't see why you're doing a whole video to this. Ah, well, because, uh, because uh, again, we are, rea we are in this framework where we have traded this complicated quantum system here for this much simpler description here in terms of uh, classical variables but uh, the input from the original system so the input from the microscopic model is entirely hidden here so the microscopic system enters only in uh, in the the function that uh, so in the pressure as a function of the uh, d density in the in the stationary state, which is here just the ground state, at uh, so stationary state with zero momentum, and uh, here it's just the ground state. And uh, but this pressure, as I said, we should, uh, or if you want the equation of state, we should calculate, assuming that we have this. Uh, so we should calculate the expectation values of the mom of the currents, assuming that we have this separation of scales, and s so that we can trade. The, f the fluid cells at the mesoscopic level by the homogeneous translation invariant problem in the thermodynamic limit. This is what we are doing here. Is that clear? This is what it means to do hydrodynamics. I mean, the whole word hydrodynamics mean, means, means this, means all of this. Uh, Yes, yes. Uh, so Euler scale is the zeroth order. If you want to include uh, gradient corrections, then it's beyond Euler. Mm -hmm. And then this equation would look more like uh, Navier-Stokes. Mm -hmm. uh, all right. So so now. Yeah, so what's the algorithm if you want to if you want to calculate the pressure in the ground state? <laughs> so uh, what you should do is uh, pick some uh, theta f. So theta f is just some uh, some some velocity. So you pick some velocity. For that velocity, you solve this integral equation numerically. Uh, so, I mean, this equation may look uh, scary because it's an, an integral equation, but uh, but uh, at least numerically, it's it's easy to solve because you, you just uh, you can just discretize the integral, and then this is just a, a linear problem. So it's a, a matrix acting on the vector of the values of of rho p at the positions where you've discretized, and so this is just linear. So you can uh, easily easily get a good estimate of rho p numerically for a given theta f and then for this rho p you can calculate rho and the energy density and uh, i haven't finished here uh, yes so from this thermodynamic uh, relation so this is some thermodynamic relation which you may prove Okay, so you use this, and then uh, you see that the pressure has to be given by. So this implies that the pressure, in terms of, uh, yeah. So the pressure is just rho e. Rho e is now up, okay. rho e viewed as a function of rho plus rho uh, d rho e over d rho at t equals zero. Okay, so because t equals zero, this terms drop, and and then this is a consequence of of that. 
Okay. So this is one uh, way of getting the pressure. So again, if you want to get this pressure, to just plot this curve, the pressure as a function of rho in this model, then uh, you pick some theta f, you calculate the corresponding rho p, you inject the rho p there, this gives you some rho. So this gives you rho as a function of theta f, and also rho e as a function of theta f. Then you do that for, you, you scan va different values of theta f such that you get the, the density that you want. And, and then this is it. Okay, so it's, uh, it's not completely explicit analytically, but, uh, but uh, numerically at least it's very, it's perfectly, uh, uh, it's uh, perfectly efficient. And you then you can just tabulate uh, values, the values of p as a function of rho, and then you have an, a very efficient uh, scheme to do uh, to do hydrodynamics. Okay, so at this point I would like to show you uh, just some pictures. Uh, what should I do, Filippo? Uh. I, I'm pressing it, but it's not doing. Mm -hmm. All right. Uh, yes, okay. So uh, this is the law of paper. So this is why it's called the equation of love. So, this guy Love was the first to write it in the context of uh, in the context of uh, an electrostatic problem in, in three dimensions. That the that's the equation. In this paper, I also like the abstract. So this is the abstract. You can have a look at it. So, so I mean, he he gets to the point uh, very quickly. It's <laughs> still like. This guy did did something, but it's completely wrong. And <laughs> uh, okay, so uh, okay, so this at this point, I've I've discussed uh, hydrodynamics at a really at a Wikipedia level. But uh, so this is just to show you that it's already useful uh, if you want to compare to even to state of the art uh, modern experiments. So. And it's a technique that is actually used by cold atom theorists. So, uh, so this is here uh, some data that I'm showing you from uh, Isabel Bouchoul and Max Schemer in Palaiso. And um, so what they do here is that they prepare a, a one-dimensional cloud, uh, which is uh, uh, mo uh, modeled by this uh, Hamiltonian here. Uh, it's a cloud of about 5,000 atoms, so there's absolutely no hope of uh, simulating this uh, exactly, for simulating the full quantum problem. And what they do is that they prepare the cloud in a uh, potential V here, which is harmonic, and they j then they just release uh, the trap. And then the atoms expand, so here what you see is the density profiles, or rho of x, at different times after the expansion, so the noisy lines are uh, are the are the experimental data averaged over a, a, a number of samples. So you get these nice curves, and and the the f the, f the plane line here is just obtained by solving uh, this hydrodynamic uh, equation with the pressure that I showed you. So it works uh, very well. I'm cheating a little bit because this is not at zero temperature, so I, I have kept track of temperature, but uh, for the purpose of this talk, let's, let me just, uh, let me just uh, uh, pretend that this is zero temperature. So, yes, yeah, so you see, it's, uh, it's already quite uh, useful. Good, uh, that's, that's it. So this hydrodynamic uh, method, it's... Uh,
more details about uh, what we do here. Um, okay, so the initial state, yeah, yeah, I need to discuss what the initial state is. Uh, all right, so let's do that. Uh, let's see. Yeah, okay, so the the initial state, okay, so I need an initial condition if I really want to do something, to do some useful uh, calculation. And uh, the initial condition for, for this uh, for this data set that I showed you, uh, it's taken as the, so, we are assuming that it's uh, at equilibrium in the trap, so u is zero everywhere, so the, there's no mean velocity for the fluid. And, uh, and rho, so the density, is taken as the hydrostatic, as the hydrostatic density, so it's the solution, uh, the solution of the Euler equation in the uh, harmonic trap, in the harmonic trap. Um, uh, yes, with uh, with u equals zero here. Now you can uh, easily so just again using the same uh, thermo uh, thermodynamic relation as earlier. Uh, in fact, you can see that this means that uh, that the initial density profile. Let me call it rho naught. So the initial uh, density profile at position x is going to be given by the density. So the density rho is a function of the local of the ke chemical potential for the homogeneous problem, and then uh, this is just means that this initial uh, density profile is given by the density at the local value of the chemical potential. So this is called uh, this is the local density approximation. Approximation. So, which is the same thing as hydrostatic. So, um, so you, yeah, so the, the the initial state is just the, the this hydrostatic uh, state. So see if we know V and we know we are at zero temperature and we know the total number of particles, then uh, this fixes uh, this fixes this rho of rho naught of x. I just to ha have the adjust. I have to adjust the global chemical potential so, so that the, the total number of particles is correct. And that gives me the initial condition. And then you can just evolve it numerically with the formula for the pressure given by the equation of love. And uh, that's it. Well, yes, okay, but uh, all right. So, so forget about the chemical potential then, and uh, just uh, just say that rho naught of x is the solution of this uh, this equation here. I just wanted to say it's the local density approximation because some people, I mean, yeah, just to be clear, so just to 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 say clearly that it's the same thing. But uh, if you yeah, if you don't want to talk about chemical potential, it's okay. So. Okay, so then rho naught, the initial condition, is the solution to this equation with the constraint that the total number of particles in the system should be n, and n was about 5,000 or something for, for this, for the data I showed. Uh, all right, I uh, don't have much time left. Uh, Uh, okay, so perhaps just let me one. <laughs> okay, now let me let me skip this, and uh, go to. Okay, so now and now let me go to 
what we will be interested in for the in the next lecture mostly and this is uh, about looking at quantum fluctuations around around this classical uh, hydrodynamic uh, classical hydrodynamics that i've discussed so far uh, Uh, by the way, the, so the equation of love, I think, in, in, beta, in the beta ansatz literature, it's called it's, it's called leap equation. <laughs> Notice that uh, if you if you speak German, then <laughs> it's it's kind of consistent. Uh, so. All right, so two words, uh, quantum hydrodynamics. And this will probably connect to the lecture of, of Thierry also. Um, so we, uh, we have traded a quantum model for a simple classical hydrodynamic description. The only way the quantum model uh, show, uh, appears is in this function is, the, is in the pressure as a function of the density. Uh, but otherwise, uh, there is nothing quantum there. So we are obviously uh, missing some, some things, some effects. In particular, in that description, uh, the, for instance, the initial, the initial uh, system is just described by this, uh, by this continuous density. It has no correlations or anything at different points. Uh, this is just because we have assumed that we have separations of scales, and so that separation of scales ensures us that we can somehow chop the system into small, s small fluid cells that are completely independent to each other, from each other, so they, they don't talk. So no correlations or no nothing. And this is, uh, this is not... Uh, this is not uh, what's happening in, in the real system because the real system would have, uh, it's a quantum system, it would have quantum fluctuations, interesting correlation functions and so on. So we would like to be able to reconstruct some of these effects on top of the classical, uh, on top of the classical solution. And, and, and this is, uh, this is uh, what, uh, what people do. By doing, uh, by trying to make this hydrodynamics uh, quantum. Uh, so let me briefly, briefly discuss this. So how how are we going to make this uh, quantum? So there are several uh, possibilities uh, in the literature. You basically, yeah. So the, there are as many uh, as many formalisms to quantize this as there are people working on on Luttinger liquids, I guess. But uh, okay, so I, I will do it. Uh, I will do it as as follows because I want to emphasize the connection with the effective uh, field theory that we've discussed uh, in the in the in the tutorial last week. And so then the best uh, or most uh, direct way of arriving at that is to talk about uh, path integrals. So what I want to do is uh, I want to imagine that I have an action S of rho and um, of my classical uh, variables rho and u or rho and j because j is just uh, uh, rho times u the current is just the, the mass density times the velocity uh, so I want to have an action and I want to put this in a, in a path integral so I want to uh, integrate over, over all space-time configurations uh, let me space-time uh, configurations uh, with uh, uh, i divided by h bar times my action here, j, rho and j.
um, yeah. This would define some partition some partition function, but then uh, I, I would. Uh, yeah, with that, you could, uh, with a formula, if you had a formalism like that, then you would be able to calculate correlation functions. Um, okay, so how, how should we choose this action? So it should be local. So it should be of the form dx dt times some functional of uh, rho and j. Let me, okay, so at the Euler scale, again, we can just assume that this is a function of the, of, of rho and j at, at point x and t, so no, no derivatives. So locality is a uh, is an important uh, requirement, and uh, and we and we would and and of course what we want in order to relate this to this classical hydrodynamics is here is that um, if we write the equations of motion uh, for this action here, we want to be able to recover the equations on top there, and. Uh, So we are not going to try, uh, treat the two equations uh, on the same footing. So uh, because you should remember that rho is a density and j is the associated current, so they should be. So they are constrained by the, the continuity equation, and the continuity equation we are not going to get from the variational principle. We're just going to impose it. Okay. So this means that, uh, in fact, here. I'm not really, I will not take a path integral over all possible uh, functions rho and j. I will uh, assume that they, are, that they are constrained by the continuity equation, which is like uh, if you want having a delta function here. Okay, so rho and j are not uh, really uh, independent. And so now uh, what this means in terms of, of this is that the first equation will be satisfied automatically because it's a constraint that we impose. And then we want to be able to, d d to get the second equation by looking at the variational principle under that constraint. Um, so uh, okay, so it wouldn't be very difficult to do it now, but uh, but this is kind of, uh, this is uh, actually not really the main point. So let me let me just uh, assume that we have uh, a function uh, that we have an action that does this, and 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 see what the consequence of that is, without entering uh, the specific f without writing the specific form of f. Uh, so now let's assume that we have a classical configuration, so a function rho classical of x and t and a function j of x and t, uh, j classical of x and t, which satisfies uh, the, the Euler equation, which uh, is a solution. of the classical equations above. Of those equations. Uh, then we want to look at fluctuations around these, uh, the, uh, around this uh, classical equation. So, so we want to take rho, uh, rho as rho classical plus some delta rho, and j as some j classical plus some delta j. And rho and j should be satisfy the constraint, so they should satisfy the continuity equation. But we know that rho classical and j classical sa already satisfy the continuity equation, and so what we should have is that we should have dt delta rho plus dx delta j 
equals zero. Um, and so a simple way of solving that constraint is to introduce a function h that will depend on x and t uh, so, so that delta rho is okay just let me let me put some normali normali normalization factors so that we recover the same notations as last time so this is uh, derivative with respect to x of h and delta j is just minus 1 over 2 pi and derivative with respect to t of h, okay? So now this automatically solves this constraint and so around, around, this, uh, around the classical solution we can now replace this uh, path integral over rho and j constrained by the constrained by the continuity equation by a single path integral over h. There's no delta function anymore. And put e to the h bar integral, well, okay, so s of uh, rho classical plus 1 over 2 pi dx h j classical minus 1 over 2 pi d t h okay Erase this then. <laughs> All right, so now uh, we don't. I mean, this can be, of course, extremely, in general, would be an extremely complicated function of both variables. But, uh, but uh, since we're interested in, in fluctuations around some classical, pro uh, small fluctuations around some classical profile, we may just expand it. And uh, so we can just expand it. And of course, by the first order is going to vanish because this is our assumption that uh, that this action is a good action for the class. So that the variational principle gives the e classical equations of motions, and so rho classical and j classical is a, a, a solution of these equations. So by construction at the first order, this vanishes, and so we can say that this is rho classical j classical plus okay so the first order is just uh, zero and so we goes to second order and at second order this will have to take this a form like this uh, so it will be dth dx h here some two by two matrix which is the essentially the hessian of 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 the of this uh, functional of the functional f and uh, dth dxh mm. well let's pretend that there's no jacobian uh, yeah i mean you can ask I mean, the correct form in the end is this one, not, not the one I wrote earlier anyway, so this was just to motivate, uh, to motivate it. Uh, yeah. Uh, the answer is I don't really know, but so let, let's just pretend uh, there's no Jacobian. Uh, yeah, okay, and so let me just to get the same normalization factor as last time, let me just call this, let me put an h bar here and an 8 pi times k. Uh, sorry, sorry, okay, 8 pi. 
uh, h bar over 8 pi. And yeah, so what's important here is that we have this 2 by 2 matrix, which, uh, and okay, so and they are, they are, of course, higher order terms in principle, higher order terms in, uh, in uh, dt in derivatives of h. Here we see that we get a quadratic action for the field H. And so now if we, we think as a, if we think of this as a field theory uh, for, that describes the fluctuations of H, then in two dimensions, so in two, dim in two dimensions or, or one plus one dimensions or one plus one dimensions, these higher order terms here are all uh, RG irrelevant, so irrelevant in the in the renormalization, renormalization group sense, and, and, and so we will uh, omit them. Okay, so you can discuss whether or not it makes sense to omit them, uh, and actually for some purposes it's important to keep them, but, uh, but, but we'll, we will ob omit them. And, uh, yeah, and so that basically is Luttinger liquid theory. Uh, in the sense that uh, we are looking at quantum fluctuations around some classical uh, some classical uh, some classical configuration of our fluid, uh, and that's captured by a quadratic action, so by a free boson conformal field theory, or in the language that I used last time, uh, a Gaussian free field. Uh, so let me just elaborate a little bit on the notations, and then, and then I'll stop. Uh, what should I erase? Let's erase this. Uh, so, any questions at this point? Or? Yes, Fabian. Yes, I am going to this uh, detail to s talk about that in uh, uh, yeah in in. I will give quite a lot to discuss quite a lot this in in in, in detail uh, but not not today yes yeah of course this is very important because it's not sufficient to know the action of your effective th field theory you also need to be able to identify the opera the operators in the microscopic model with the uh, in the microscopic models with the one in the effect with the ones in the effective theory this is of course a, a crucial step uh, and we'll discuss this. Uh, actually, I was planning to spend quite a lot of time on this, but 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 not not today. Uh, yes. Okay. So um, so I don't know exactly what uh, Thierry will talk about, but uh, he will uh, probably uh, use very uh, use different notations and different ar arguments. Uh, but uh, in the end, I think it's important. Uh, just that you realize that all these uh, that there there are several ways of talking about Luttinger liquids, but in the end uh, they all match. And uh, just to uh, uh, try to connect with the more standard uh, notation, perhaps notations, uh, perhaps let me just uh, let me just uh, uh, say this. So this matrix here is a two by two symmetric matrix. So it has it a symmetric matrix, and also because uh, yeah, because um, okay, because we are discussing things in Lorentzian space, so in in, in real time, this this matrix happens to have a a, a negative determinant. Uh, 
But so, okay, so I can always, uh, so I have, so this symmetri this matrix is, is parameterized by three parameters. So I have three real parameters that enter this effective uh, field theory. And those three real parameters, uh, I should be able to fix them in terms of uh, row classical and J classical at position X and T, okay? Because A here, this matrix depend on, depends on X and T typically. And it depends on X and T through uh, the classical solution. So it, because it's, it's uh, quantum fluctuations around the classical solution. So the effective action depends on the classical solution. And um, okay, so it's convenient to take out the determinant of A, and so, so that okay, so that the matrix uh, is okay. I will write it as this. So. G here is a two by two matrix. Which is essentially the inverse of A up to some normalization. This is a matrix that has determinant one or minus one, sorry, minus one. Okay, just because I, I since I have the inverse of G and uh, I multiply by square root of the determinant. This this has to have a, a determinant of plus or minus one. This is just a, a, a way of writing uh, uh, the mo most general uh, two by two matrix symmetric uh, with determinant minus one. And I've taken out the normalization of the determinant, uh, which is uh, K. Okay. So now if I plug this. Uh, in the effect of, in this effective action that we've that we got then this effective action just becomes h bar over 8 pi k and, uh, sorry let me be precise so that, okay so h bar uh, dx dt which I am going to write as D2x, where x0, I just want to use covariant coordinates because it will be useful. So this is just xt. This becomes minus that g divided by 8 by k. Okay, so this is this effective action that we found for the field h. It's this. So this uh, comes here now, times uh, the inverse of G. So this I can write as G A B D A H D B H. So it's the two dimensional uh, boson or gas and free field in some, me in some metric G that has emerged and that is fixed by the classical background. And uh, we can always choose the system of coordinates so just by, by picking some, some transformation, some nice coordinates. Let's pick some nice coordinates, uh, two and xi, say, where, uh, such that this uh, becomes the flat metric. And then we are really back at the same, exact same thing as last uh, week. So then we are really back at, at, at this. This is now gradient h squared in those coordinates, and so it's really just the Gaussian free field as we've discussed. And so all correlation functions can be calculated using the machinery of last time. K here, the K that showed up, uh, K. This is the Latinger parameter K. Latinger parameter k, and uh, the yeah okay, and the metric so this g, which so this is g a b d, x a d x e b. Uh, this in coordinates x and t. This happens to be x 
minus u plus v dt times minus u minus v dt, where u is the u from the classical solution, so it's the so it's a, it's a, so it's the mean velocity of the fluid, and v v is the sound velocity. Uh, so what this what this means here, what this metric e here is, is the is the metric is the natural metric in which uh, sound waves propagate, for, so sound waves on top of the classical fluid. So you take your classical equations. If you perturb them, this is entirely classical. So if you just perturb them a little bit, you replace rho by rho plus delta rho, then you will see that uh, it's a, you have a wave that will that will propagate and. Uh, and uh, and that will propagate along uh, the along along the null geodesics of that metric. This, this is just saying that uh, you have uh, sound waves that go to the left or to the right because we are in one D, and this is the natural uh, object, in, natural metric in which they propagate. Uh, all right. So let, yeah, uh, I have to stop. Sorry. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, sure. No, sorry, uh, sorry. I, I, I was uh, very slow at the end.